This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is October the 3rd, 2021, and I'm here with Bill Lawrence, and we're at the Warbirds Over the Beach Air Show in Pungo, Virginia. Bill, thanks for coming in and uh, taking some time out of your day to talk with me. No problem. What's your uh, full name? Uh, William A. Lawrence II. Where were you born? Queens, New York. So um, tell us real briefly um, your career path before you end up spending some time overseas. Um, from 1978 to 2008, I worked for Prince William County Police Department. I retired from sworn duty in 2003, and then I got hired back as a uh, background investigator from 2003 to 2008. And then I resigned in 2008 and accepted a con security contractor position in Afghanistan. Uh, and what, when you were with the police department, what type of um, specialties did you have? Uh, I was a fire alternate firearms instructor for many years. But uh, most of my career was spent uh, working. In, I spent 12 years in patrol. I spent nine years as a motorcycle officer, and I spent about four years as a uh, vice narcotics officer. Um, so 9/11. Where were you on 9/11? Do you remember what um, how you, how you learned about the attack? I remember exactly. I was running radar in uh, Lake Ridge, Virginia, up on Old Bridge Road, in a school zone, and I was on my police motor. And I'd stopped a man and um, got his license from him, told him he was speeding, and I was get, issuing him a, a summons. So I went back to the, the motor and wrote the ticket. When I walked back up to the guy's car, he looked at me, he was listening to his car radio, and he said, an airplane just fl just collided with the World Trade Center. I was like, okay, I mean, I, it was tragic, I did, but it really didn't mean anything to me at the mm -hmm. point, at the time, so I had him, I gave him, had him sign his summons, gave him his copy, and I went back to my police motor, and uh, I had mounted a, a AM-FM stereo down in the saddlebag, so I turned that on because I wanted to hear, it. and sure enough, it was all over the news talking about the, uh, you know, the plane that hit the World Trade Center, and then shortly thereafter, there, you know, they announced the second plane had hit. So we, I definitely figured, okay, something, something big's going on now. We definitely got troubled. So what, what, um, what? additional duties, if any, did you have after the attacks and how did the police department and, and Prince William respond to it? Um, I got assigned for several shifts up to the at the Pentagon, like a, a day or two after the Pentagon was struck. Uh, me and my partner um, were assigned to go up there with our police motors and go to the go to the Pentagon. We got there, we were assigned to escort the vehicles that were taking the, the body parts and the, and the rubble away from the collision site and then they were moving those all those trucks and all that material to the north parking lot of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So we would escort the trucks to be sure nobody, you know, approached the trucks or tried to tamper with them or get a souvenir or something. So I did that for either two or three nights in a row. We would start at 6, 6 p.m. and our shift was over at 6 a.m. So we were out there all night. Can you describe what the uh, Pentagon looked like? It was amazing. You know, from a distance, it didn't look that bad, but then when you got close, it was just this humongous hole, and I, it just reeked of, you could smell the, you know, the, the jet fuel, I guess it was, and the burning smell, and there was workers everywhere digging and, and moving material, and there was, you know, you had the uh, Red Cross out there, you had all these different groups that had tents set up, and they were taking care of and feeding the workers. Um, you had security people out there, checking IDs and issuing ID cards. The Secret Service was out there, mm -hmm. issued us all ID cards, took our picture and got our information. And uh, it, it was quite a production. I, I was just amazed how much was going on there. Mm -hmm. So um, for somebody who's watching this video doesn't quite understand the geography, how close is Prince William County to um, Washington, D.C.? I'm thinking it's 30 miles, 35 mm -hmm. miles, straight south on Interstate 95, mm -hmm. just go straight, I think it's about 30, 35 miles. Gotcha. Um, it sounds like a stupid question, but do you remember how you felt when you heard the, that we were under attack and then being able to actually visualize it once you got there? Were, were, were you pissed off? Were you, I mean, what was going on through your mind? Yeah, it was, to me, it was just, I was like, what's gonna happen next? I mean, all those events happened on that one day and I was just thinking, okay, what's coming next? Is this, I'm sure this is some sort of uh, rep, you know, retribution for whatever we were doing overseas in the Middle East at the time. And um, I figured that the attacks were going to escalate. 
maybe hit military facilities. I was surprised, kind of surprised that they had hit you know, New York City like that. I thought they would hit a military facility if they were going to mm -hmm. do anything. So it was definitely baffling to me. I was uh, just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen next. And what year did you say you retired? I retired from sworn duty in 03. Okay. And then I worked for the police department as a permanent uh, part-time background investigator until 2008. And um, what changes, if any, did the attacks have on American law enforcement in general? Um, from, from what I observed, people were just, uh, you, you became more suspicious of the cars you were stopping, you were looking at people and kind of looking at their ethnic background and you became more suspicious in your mind. You're, and I was constantly doing traffic stops, working as a motorcycle cop. We were always writing tickets and in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, okay, am I gonna stop a car that's, that's got a, some sort of a terrorist in it or, mm -hmm. or somebody who's got bad intentions for the US? You just didn't know. So your, your mind, mind was thinking those things, even though it, it probably wasn't happening, but uh, it was definitely on my mind when I was working until I retired. All right, let's fast forward a little bit. So at some point in time, you get involved in contractor work. Yes. Tell, tell us um, how you became interested in doing that, how the job opportunity, and then what type of work it was you were doing. One of the guys I had retired with had already gone overseas to Afghanistan, and he was there working for uh, DynCorp, DynCorp International, out of, uh, I think they were headquartered at the time out of um, Dubai. And uh, they also had a, their main headquarters, I think it was in Texas, but they were advertising contracts through um, DynCorp um, International Free Zone, which was, their offices were all in uh, Dubai. So he kept telling me, I was corresponding with him uh, back and forth, and he kept saying, you should come over here. You're, you're retired, come on over and you can make, uh, and the money's really good. And so I started looking into it and I realized that, yeah, there's, there's some good money to be made. I said, well, it, you know, it, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, there's a war going on over there, I thought, and, and, um, and my friend who was over there, he says, nah, it's fine, you know, we're good, we got, a good, we got good security, we're in good camps, they take care of you. I said, all right, I think I'll go ahead and sign up for it. So I did. And um, what, what, what is the, um, what's the position? What, what, what exactly was it that you were the doing? The position, I was, I was assigned as a, uh, as a mentor, as a police mentor for the Afghan police program with DynCorp International. And um, our duties was pretty much traveling out to various police district stations in the northern part of Afghanistan, up near Kanduz. We would travel out and do compliance inspections. And the compliance inspections had been originated by the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army had outfitted these police stations with their, with their weapons, with their vehicles, and was paying their salaries. And so we were going out and following up on what the Army had done. And the Army had given us a, a compliance inspection uh, booklet with all these in inspection forms in it. So we would go out to these various stations and meet with the finance officer at the station, meet with the personnel officer, meet with the training officer, meet with the chief, and then we would go through this checklist and find out if they were doing what they were supposed to be doing according to the U.S. Army, since the U.S. Army was was funding them and, and you know paying for some of their facilities. The U.S. Army was installing wells for them was paying their salary and, and you know paying for their vehicles and their fuel. Mm -hmm. So we would go out there and fill out these reports and then we would submit them back to the Army. Then the Army would follow up with us and say, well, why aren't they doing this? Or did you ask them about this? So a lot of times we, we'd have to go back out there and, and make some, uh, give some advice or offer mm -hmm. some uh, training or whatever they may need to get up to, up to par as far as the, you know, the Army was looking for. So uh, what, what, what month and year did you get over there, if you remember the month? Um, early, it was early 2008 was when I went over there. Okay. And um, did you receive, did, like, did they send you through like a training program first, or is it OJT? Yeah, we went, through, we went through a training pros, program. It was, um, if I remember, it was about three weeks long. Mm -hmm. We went through, and it was a... That's in the U.S.? It was in the U.S., and it, it was, they brought all these most of them were uh, former police officers. They brought them into the training program and there was a lot of, a lot of shooting, a lot of physical stuff. There was a lot of uh, driving. Um, there was a lot of classrooms just on, on how to 
how to learn about the culture over there. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it took about three weeks to finish all that training. Where's that at? It was in Fredericksburg. It was at a, uh, it was at a site, I forget the name of the site, but they did training for, uh, for U.S. government mm -hmm. civilian positions, I guess. And okay. so they had a, you know, a shooting range out there. They had driving facilities. They had all the vehicles and, mm -hmm. and weapons that we would be using overseas. So we're talking about weapons. So you were armed. Yes. Um, so I mean, what, what kind of what kind of kit did you guys have? We were armed. Everybody was issued a, an M4, and it was either a three round burst or full automatic, depending. You know, you, kind of luck of the draw, which one you get issued. But they were at, at the bare minimum. They were the three round burst models of the M4, and then we were issued a uh, the M9 pistol, which is a, a is, was a Beretta at the time. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so you're in Afghanistan. What's your typical day consist of? Do you have a, like a? I assume you have a translator. Do you have do you have a, a security team that's protecting you, or you're just like on your own with a couple other guys? How's that work? We were, we had, typically we would travel out to these district stations. Some of them were 50, 60 miles out, down dirt roads and way out in the, up in the mountains or wherever they may be. We would always travel with two trucks, and the trucks were fully armed. Um, I mean, they were armored, and um, all contractors in these trucks. Or all contractors. Any, okay. There was one, so so there would be three contractors in each truck, and one interpreter in each truck. So mm -hmm. it was four. It was eight of us would go out, and we in the in the right front passenger seat, we had security contractors riding with us, and typically they were either Romanian or South African. So they came with us. They would operate the help us operate the radios. And they also carried some more hev some heavier um, weaponry with them. They they would carry a a two forty nine saw, and they would carry some smoke grenades and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they would handle the radios, and they would do all the uh, you know help us with the directions, getting where we were going. Then we took care of driving the vehicles and uh, and being lookouts when we weren't driving. Were you pretty comfortable with the guys you were working with? Yes, they were good. Uh, you know, some of the some of the contractors were were from police departments in very small jurisdictions throughout the U.S. Some of them had only been a police officer for four or five years, and sometimes that was a, that that could be an issue because they didn't have much experience at dealing with people, and uh, so sometimes it was difficult uh, working with some of the really the younger inexperienced contractors. Mm -hmm. The older contractors, for the most part, had been twenty or plus year police officers somewhere. A lot of them had former military experience and they have police experience so they were a little more comfortable for me to work with anyway because they seemed to know exactly what we were what our mission was and what we were supposed to do and how to act appropriately the, um, the translators they, they armed translators were not mm -hmm. we gave them a you know a body vest body armor to wear mm -hmm. but they were not armed no you trust those guys for the most part you would but but you in the back of your mind you're thinking okay He's got to think of his own family himself. We had one of our uh, interpreters come to camp one morning and, and tell the, the supervisors that he found a note on his front door of his house saying, we know that you work for the Americans and uh, you better you better stop doing that. So he came to the camp with a note and showed it to the supervisors. And unfortunately, they had to fire the guy because they said, okay, well, he's got to make a choice between his family or us. His loyalty is probably to, going to be to his family. He was a good interpreter, but unfortunately, we had to terminate him because we didn't want him to be pressured and then give up any information to whoever yeah. was, you know, th making threats to him and his family. Mm -hmm. So, so where are you bedding down at at night? Where are you staying? We stayed in a, a camp. Uh, you know, we had a camp that had guard towers, and uh, it, it was just a military a, U.S. military camp. No, it wasn't military. It was uh, it was manned by by us. And, and there was a, in the guard towers, we had Nepalese guards that were working, they were hired uh, to run the guard towers. And then we were in the, you know, of course we were in there also, we had all of our weapons and our, our security teams were in there also. And then we also had a certain number, the one camp I was at was also a, a, a police academy. So some of the, I was a mentor, but some of the other guys I worked with were advisors, and they actually worked as instructors in the police academy. They didn't leave the camp; mm -hmm. they, they would stay in the camp with the students. And there was, you know, several hundred students that lived in the camp with with us. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed to leave. They didn't want them, you know, leaving and coming back and bringing anything they weren't supposed to have with them back into the camp. 
So, so how many months were you over there? I was over there a total of 23 months with two different companies. So the first tour was how long about with DynCorp? DynCorp, I was there 12 months. I had a full year with DynCorp. And then, so what was the second company and what, when was that that you the went? The second company was in 2000, late, late 2009. It was uh, Blackwater, USA. And they, we eventually, during the middle of my uh, you know, initial training, they started changing their name. They had to change their name to U.S. Training Center. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, ultimately changed their name to um, Z, spelled, spelled X-E, Z. Mm -hmm. And now, they, then they changed their name to Academy. So that they went through some transition during that time period. I think they had some difficulties in Iraq and some difficulties in Afghanistan with some of their personnel. Yeah. So they ended up, the company I think went through some ownership changes, some, the CEO was changed out. So they, uh, they changed the name several times on us. What, um, what, what type of work are you doing with them? Same, same animal, same, same type of work you were doing with DynCorp or different? Yeah, a lot of, uh, with DynCorp I was pretty much, I was outside the you know, camp and then sometimes they would detail us to do some security, like if they had some State Department, people came over and wanted to go visit one of these police stations or wanted to go visit a, a project they had funded, they would also use us for security to take the State Department employees out. Now when I worked for uh, Blackwater over there, we were uh, strictly instructors and we had a, a camp up near the Tora Bora Mountains and it was just us in there and uh, we had students. So we, they were Afghan border police students with a little bit different than the Afghan, uh, regular Afghan police. What, what's your overall impression of the Afghan police and um, other, uh, the border patrol guys? What's your overall impression of them? Some of them, you could tell that they were really interested in the training, they appreciated the training, but then other ones would, didn't seem to really care. It, it just seemed to me like they were there just to get a paycheck or have a, a roof over their head, and I always question their loyalty, whether whether they would turn and run if you know things got really bad. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, um, were you staying in similar type of environment on your second tour, like like a, a bait, like a civilian base? Or? Yes, it was just a civilian base. The camp we stayed at was called uh, Fob uh, Lone Star, and it was. Uh, it was outside of Jalalabad, and it was out up near the Tora Bora Mountains. It, it was actually owned by Blackwater. Blackwater had built the facility, and they owned it. And that tour in 2009, late 2009, how long was that one? That one I went, uh, let's see, almost a year, okay. not, not a full year. And then we, we actually started losing our contract, so we had a we had a choice of either going with another company and taking a, a cut in pay or going back home and most of us elected just to come back home. Mm -hmm. It was the, the cut in pay was probably 50%. It yeah. was a big difference. So a lot of us said, no, we're not doing that. So um, you, you, you spent almost two years overseas. Are you able to come home during that duration at all? Like yes, we you, had breaks. Okay. We had breaks and uh, now when I was in uh, with Dying Corps, I stayed in country 330 days because if you came back in the U.S. Um, more than I think it was more than 35 days in a 12-month period, you didn't you had to pay taxes on everything that you made. If you stayed out of the U.S. at least 330 days out of 12 months, then you got a tax exemption, a large tax exemption. Mm -hmm. Then you only paid a little bit of tax on what you made over that that amount. So the first year I intentionally stayed out of the U.S. I stayed in Afghanistan the whole time pretty mm -hmm. much. I came home twice for uh, two short breaks. And then when I worked for Blackwater, we were actually cycled through. They would send you over there for four months, you'd come home for like two months. So the first time you came home, you'd already blown the, uh, you know, the 35 day period. So you had to pay taxes on everything you made with Blackwater. How'd you keep in touch with your family when you were overseas? It was, we had internet. Mm -hmm. We had internet or, you know, phones. The cell phone systems was excellent in Afghanistan. I could just make a phone call right from my cell phone anywhere out in the middle of the desert. Gotcha. It, it worked very well. Um, did you feel relatively safe over there? Did you have any, any uh, security issues during your, your two tours? There was, yeah, there was constant. We constantly had, uh, especially when I was up in Kanduz, we had, we had rocket attacks pretty regularly. At least once or twice a month, you know, a rocket would come in 
come land near the camp or in the camp. And so you were constantly aware of that. Um, out driving around, we were constantly coming up on, on IEDs where roads had been closed off or an IED had, had just gone off and the road was blocked and we'd have to, you know, make, you know, turn around, go back. Or, and uh, mm -hmm. so the, it was always something going, going on over there. Pretty good relationship between contractors and the military guys, U.S. military guys? Yeah, we worked closely with, uh, with a military unit that was down the road from us. And sometimes they would call us and say, hey, we've got a couple of spots open in our MRAP. If, you, if a couple of the mentors want to ride with us for the day, you can come out with us. We would go out with them a lot of times, mm -hmm. go out with the Army. And it was, a, it was an Army, uh, I guess it was a National Guard or Reserve unit. And they would go out, and most of us didn't like to go with them because they, they drove so slow. I mean, they had lots of nice equipment, but they went so slow, and we were sitting there, we felt like we were sitting ducks mm -hmm. riding in those MRAPs, even though they're heavily armored. So uh, I enjoyed just being in our own trucks, and we could move down the road uh, even though everybody knew who, that we weren't, uh, you know, f we, we weren't from Afghanistan, they knew they knew we were foreigners from somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I felt always felt like they weren't, we weren't as much of a threat as, as somebody riding around in a military vehicle. Yeah. So um, you guys are going to work, going to a site. You got your two trucks going, and something if something does pop off, who are you calling? Do you guys have comms with with that military base nearby, and then they're your your QRF, or did you guys have a civilian QRF? How, how did that work? We had civilian QRFs. A lot of us, if we weren't assigned to go out on that particular day, we were at camp on, on standby for QRF. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the radios, they had, they had good radio systems over there. They could reach, we could be out 40 miles away from camp, and that uh, radio, would, that Kodan radio would still transmit back to the camp. And in reality, the cell phone worked just as well or better. So we, we always had that option. So a lot of times, some of the guys would be out and it would have a problem, uh, like a like a vehicle breakdown or, or something, and they would just call for the QRF to come out and give them a hand. And then we had the option of calling the military. We had several different military. Um, we had German military in the area, Hungarian military, mm -hmm. and then we also had um, U.S. military on and off. They weren't always there. A lot of them were reserve or National Guard units. They would come in for a couple of months and they would leave. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we didn't have access to U.S. military. Yeah. Um, let's fast forward now um, to what recently happened. Um, obviously, as you know, just for the, for the purpose of the recording, um, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan. Um, when you learned of that, um, what, what, were your, what were your thoughts? And do you have, have, have any thoughts about what, what's recently been going on? I felt, I felt bad for the Afghans that got left behind, the ones that were, were honestly working hard to work with the U.S. Um, three of my interpreters that I worked with had gotten out of the country before that happened. One of them's in California now going to college, one of them lives in upstate New York, and one of them lives in the Netherlands. So I'm still in contact with them. They're, they look happy. They're, their kids are growing up. They're just very happy to be out of that country. I know they miss their country, but they were actually the ones that I felt were trustworthy. They would. Uh, th they seemed to be pretty, pretty good about coming forward to us and telling us when they heard. They would hear something in their town, in the area of our camp, and they would come up and tell us, "Hey, I, he I heard that there's some, there's some bad guys running around, and they've got a couple of rockets, and they're talking about launching them at the camp at night." So they were good about coming and giving us information. So mm -hmm. those, you, those people, I, I trusted very much. Some of the other interpreters we worked with. Uh, I felt bad for them because they probably didn't get out of the country, so they're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, with uh, trying to find another job and trying to keep the fact that they work for Americans, you know, a secret from people so they don't get uh, get punished for it. Yeah. Um, when you think about your time overseas, are there any particular memories that stand out in your mind? Whether they're uh, frightening, funny, uh, fond memories? You have Anything that like one, one or two instances to pop in your mind? Uh, yeah, sometimes. I mean, you think about it's pretty commonplace for IEDs were always out there, and we were always driving, and you'd see damage from an IED. You knew there's not, or you knew there, you heard there's an IED somewhere on the route you were taking, so you were constantly on the lookout. And um, I, I remember one day driving up a road, and there was a there was a dead donkey laying in the middle of the road. 
So I was driving the lead truck and I was thinking, look at that donkey laying in the road. I guess I better swerve around him. As I went around the donkey, I can see electrical wires running out of his, out of the you know carcass over into some bushes on the side of the road. And immediately, you know, I said, that's an IED. But fortunately, it didn't go off. And we got away from there as quick as we could and called the local police and reported it. Then we came back through there several hours later and the donkey was gone. There was no sign of it in the road. But that memory stuck with me. I was thinking, we were lucky that day, I think. There, there was an IED in that donkey and maybe it just wasn't meant for us or, or maybe it malfunctioned. And um, another time we were in a village and we used to go out we used to go out with the local police uh, commanders and sometimes they would want to go out and question some people. They had s suspects in some crimes in their village and they would ask us to go with them. So sometimes we'd be on foot and we'd go through the villages and they're going to huts and banging on doors and, and we would assist them with doing their interviews and make some suggestions on how they could possibly uh, you know, be more effective at interviewing the person. And uh, sometimes we'd walk through those, those villages and you'd hear gunshots go off or you'd hear uh, you know, something blow up and you're, you're immediately all your, your senses are wide awake. You're looking everywhere to see if you know, somebody's targeting you. Mm -hmm. So um, before we had the camera going, you and I were talking earlier about um, the mission of, of this particular museum that, that I work for and how we want to tell the tale of not just the soldiers and the airmen and the Marines that uh, played a role in Americans in wartime, but civilians. And contractors, as I understand it, we've never had a conflict where you've had contractors involved as much as after 9-11. Can you, can you just give people an idea on, on how significant a role U.S. contractors played in, in, um, in Iraq and Afghanistan? There was so many U.S. contractors over there, I didn't realize how many were actually there. And I would, you know, we transitioned through, um, typically Dubai was the airport we transitioned to. And a lot of times we'd come into Dubai and have a layover overnight for like 12 hours before we got our flight back to the U.S. And we'd go into the restaurants or go in one of the places to have a beer. And there'd be all these, there were obviously there were Americans in there, they're wearing American flags and stuff. And you, you start talking to them and they weren't, you know, working, uh, a lot of them weren't working with the military. They weren't uh, security contractors. They were actually working for uh, uh, a company that, that manufactured something, and they were over there maintaining it. They were truck mechanics. They were truck drivers. It was, it was amazing to me how many different contractors were working over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of them had no, they were give, telling us tales of, they were, for example, I spoke to a truck driver one day. He said he's driving all over the place. He has no protection with him. And you know he's just at the mercy of if, if he gets stopped by somebody, hopefully they'll let him go. But to him, the money was well worth it, so he yeah. he continued to do it. So um, in a couple of months, you'll get a copy of this video. Um, well, we also um, store these videos on our website. Okay. So um, theoretically, 100 years from now, you might have a great 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 grandkid that might stumble <laughs> upon the video. Um, what would you want them to know about your service to your country through your, your civilian contract work? Well, I felt I was, I was doing my part even though I, I'd never been in the military. And I'd, you know, I'd, I'd done my part as a police officer, but that time had, had passed, I'd retired. So I felt like by doing this, I was still contributing to, to our country in, in some small part. And granted, you know, some part of the reason I went over there to do it was the the money they pay was very attractive, you can't deny that. So um, that was part of the reason I went over there, but I also, my, you know, my main thoughts when I was over there is I wanna do my job and do it correctly, and hopefully it'll benefit these Afghans, especially the ones I was, I was either instructing or the ones I was being a mentor to, like the police chiefs we go out and talk to, and, and we talk to them about their problems they're having with their, with their uh, police officers and stuff and make some suggestions to them. And, Hopefully, we made an made an impact. Um, well, again, I can't thank you enough for, for coming in right. and spending some time with us. It, it's a fascinating piece, I think, um, how how civilians um, volunteered to go over into these these uh, places that probably aren't so nice, especially back then, <laughs> and uh, do what you did. Thanks again, Bill. All right, thanks Good a lot. Good to see you, buddy. All right.